I'm going to begin recording now. So uh, again, welcome everyone to this session. Uh, this is Making Sense of Hearing Loss and Over-the-Counter Hearing Aids. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Joseph Mentano. He is the Chief of Audiology and Speech Language Pathology at Wall Cornell Medicine. He received his Doctor of Education in Audiology from Teachers College of Columbia University and is certified in audiology through the American Speech Language Hearing Association, also known as the ASHA. He serves on the New York State Licensure Board and is a member of the ASHA Legislative Council. Dr. Montano's clinical expertise is audiologic rehabilitation with a particular interest in adjustment to adult onset hearing loss, hearing assistive technology systems, and hearing aids. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Montano. Thank you, Andrew. I, I just have one question. Is it possible for us to have this captioned? Yes, absolutely. I will yes, start that we, right now. Can we turn on captioning? Thank you. Okay. So welcome uh, to our, our webinar. I'm so happy to be part of this. Uh, uh, I'm proud to have uh, two members of my staff, uh, Maria Pomponio and Jennifer Rhodes, who will take the lion's share of this presentation. Um, uh, it's a wonderful time in hearing, right? We, all of a sudden, we have the opportunity to have access to hearing aids like we never did before. Uh, what we're going to try to do tonight is actually walk you through this a little bit. I know that people tend to have a, a lot of questions, and I know the patients that I see, uh, I spend a lot of time talking about over-the-counter hearing aids and prescriptive hearing aids, and and uh, you know, there's so much new going on. Um, so I'm just going to go give you an overview of what our agenda is going to be. So we're going to talk a little bit about hearing loss. And we're going to talk about the specifics about prescriptive hearing aids and over-the-counter hearing aids. I'm going to give you a brief history of the over-the-counter hearing aids because it's been quite a journey. And I've been on that journey for a long time along with you know, many of my friends from uh, the Hearing Loss Association of America and ASHA and AAA and the AAO. Uh, we've all been working uh, diligently trying to prepare for the over-the-counter hearing aids. Uh, we're gonna talk about what is an over-the-counter hearing aid and what is not. Uh, we can talk about the role of the audiologist and we're gonna just kind of think about, you know, give you some thoughts for you to think about for yourself is, you know, are, are you a candidate for over-the-counter hearing aids? Is this something that's right for you? Uh, it's a great opportunity now to expand uh, the number of people who get hearing aids. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's very unfortunate that th there's so much hearing loss and so few people wearing hearing aids that can really help them. Uh, but first, let me talk a little bit about this timeline, if you could see that. Uh, there are a lot of dots on that, and, and it goes way back to uh, 2015. And, uh, and in 2015 was when the president's report, uh, or Dr., uh, Obama had a, the president's council, um, and that was the first time we were talking about over-the-counter hearing aids. Since that time, it's taken all of these years, that's seven years in my estimate, um, for all of the the bricks to be laid out to create the foundation and to finally have the uh, hearing aids available. Um, from, from the Obama era, uh, we went into uh, the FDA getting involved and having meetings with the organizations and, and people who were involved in hearing care. Um, and, and then it was uh, um, the uh, Office of Medicine, and that was, uh, you know, they came out with a final report. And then it became law in 2017. And in 2017, the FDA had three years to come up with the standards for over-the-counter hearing aids. But within those three years, we also had the pandemic and COVID. And uh, so it probably lost some priority for the FDA. Uh, but finally, um, uh, President Biden had, a, had a signed a, 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 a request that we get that done in six months, and the FDA he, uh, responded, and the laws came out. 
the standards came out in the fall of 2021 and everyone had an opportunity to comment on them uh, and they did. It was a great response uh, from consumers, from organizations. And then finally on August 16th, the uh, final standards were released and the law and the over-the-counter hearing aids became available in October. That's really a long time, seven years, uh, but it's here. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it. I think that we have a lot of growing to do. We have to figure out how it's gonna all pan out. But I think that it's really great for people with hearing loss, especially those with mild to moderate hearing loss. And um, so, you know, it's, it's funny because I'm putting together a paper that I'm gonna submit uh, to a meeting next year that takes place in September. And, and I'm, uh, the paper is gonna be called something like over-the-counter hearing aids one year later. So I don't really know what I'm gonna be talking about and uh, writing about come September. Uh, I just know what we're, we have right now and we'll see what develops over the years. It's gonna be pretty exciting, I think. Uh, so now I'd like to, to turn the podium over to uh, uh, Dr. Pomponio, who will uh, begin tonight's session. Thanks, Dr. Montano. Um, so Dr. Rhodes and I are kind of going to go back and forth on this a little bit. So I'm going to introduce her now too. Um, but I will get us started with um, a couple of definitions here, a couple of organization introductions. So before we dive into this, you're going to see a lot of references to the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association, or ASHA, and the American Academy of Audiology, or AAA. So both of those are governing bodies for audiologists. All of the audiologists at Cornell are ASHA certified, and some hold voluntary certification through AAA as well. But both have been very involved in the wording of these regulations and, and looking through these regulations, as have other professional organizations as well. So these are certainly not the only two, but they put out a lot of great references, and so you'll see them referenced, uh, referenced throughout this presentation. And we would certainly direct you to both of those for additional information. They've got really good resources, not only for professionals and for related professionals, but for consumers as well. And if Andrew could, I would love it if he could put up the poll for us now just to get a little bit more information on who is here with us today, just so that we know our audience a little bit better. Hopefully there will be something in here for all of you. But if you want to go ahead and answer that and then we'll give it a little bit of time and then we'll see what kind of answers we have coming in. So just let us know who you are. Are you someone who has hearing loss, who uses a hearing aid, doesn't use a hearing aid? Um, are you someone's caregiver, caretaker, or friend, a physician, an audiologist, a medical student, or do you fall into a different category? So we'll just give a couple more seconds to get those results in. And um, once Andrew switches that over, we'll take a look and then we'll get into things. All right, it looks like we're close to having everyone respond. Um, about 300 people on the call and we have 250 responses. So I'll give it a few more seconds and then we'll, uh, we'll end the poll. Okay, I'm gonna close it out now. And here are the results. You should see the results. Yeah, awesome. So it looks like a lot of our audience tonight um, either ha have hearing loss, some of which currently use hearing aids, about 30%, and half of you have hearing loss who don't currently use a hearing aid. So I definitely think this, well, I shouldn't say definitely think this will be helpful, but I certainly hope this will be helpful for you. Um, and hello to our fellow audiologists who are out there. Um, well, great. So we will close this out. We'll dive into things. We'll certainly have time at the end for questions. You can feel free to type them as you go. Hopefully we will 
answer a lot of them as we go, but we'll have time at the end dedicated for that as well. So just to start off, um, this is a great, I think a great display by Johns Hopkins about um, the amount of hearing loss in our country. So 38.2 million Americans aged 12 years or older have hearing loss. As you can see from this graph, the prevalence increases with increased age. Interestingly, this graph is highlighting mild to moderate hearing loss, and that's going to come into play as we start talking more and more about OTC devices. Um, but 38.2 million Americans is a is quite a large number of Americans with hearing loss. When we take into consideration that only one in four adults ages 20 and over who could benefit from hearing aids has used them, we know that we are not reaching the number of people that we hope to be reaching. Um, there are a lot more people out there with hearing loss that are not currently using hearing aids that could benefit from using them. And we certainly are excited about the prospect of over-the-counter devices being a way to get some of those individuals interesting, interested in trying amplification. There's another photo for you all out there on the right of your screen about some major styles of hearing aids. They're very common. You'll see them probably um, across all the advertisements that come your way. The great thing about those styles of hearing aids is that while they are what we would offer traditionally as hearing aids, you're gonna see a lot of the OTCs out there are pretty similar in style. So um, there should be something out there for, for most, if not everyone. So a little bit more about hearing loss in general. Um, adults wait an average of 8.9 years from when they first suspect hearing loss to actually pursue treatment. So not only are we not reaching the amount of people that we want to reach, but we know that adults are just waiting a really long time to actually tackle their hearing loss. We worry about this because untreated hearing loss is linked to some not so great things. <laughs> um, cognitive decline, falls, social isolation and depression, just to name a few of those. We know that hearing loss can affect quality of life, both at home and at work. And we know that hearing aids can help. They're not perfect, but they are very helpful. And so we certainly want to target more people who could benefit from them. OTCs are probably going to be a great way to target some of those people, which is why we're really excited about them. I'm going to stop here, turn it over to Dr. Rhodes, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about prescription versus OTC hearing aids. All right, so we're kind of looking at what are the differences between traditional prescription hearing aids that we are dispensing often here at Cornell um, and other audiologists. Um, across the country and all over the world, what are the differences? So prescription hearing aids are traditionally dispensed by an audiologist um, or a hearing instrument specialist. Um, we are the ones who make the recommendations. We are the ones that um, handle the setting up and the programming and adjusting and the fit of the hearing aid on the patient's ear. Um, and we often are making adjustments and, you know, fitting things specifically to each individual patient. Um, they can be much more costly um, or much, they can be very costly given limited insurance coverage at this point in time um, as compared to, um, on the next slide. Yeah. Um, Over-the-counter devices, in contrast, um, what they're serving to do is make hearing aids more accessible to people. You do not need an audiological evaluation. Um, you do not need to see a professional um, to obtain a device like this. Um, and they are more affordable than traditional hearing aids, which, as we know, can be very costly. Um, the difference is the consumer decides if they need the device um, based on how much hearing loss they perceive. Um, and they also um, decide if they're benefiting. Um, they also handle independently the setup of the devices, the fitting of the devices, and they are the ones who are making the adjustments. This does not overall involve an audiologist as far as the adjusting goes. Um, the technology, they have ways to um, adjust treble, bass, um, they have adjustments to volume, they have different programs in them, 
um, for different environments, but generally they're safe. They have output limits so that they cannot go dangerously loud. Um, so overall, that's not really of concern. This is just kind of an interesting schematic um, showing what are the differences and also what are the similarities between a lot of these over-the-counter devices and prescription hearing aids. Um, we're going to get into detail about a lot of this, so I'm not going to read through each of them, but it is there if anyone wants to um, refer back. But the major takeaway is um, there is a decent amount of overlap between the two devices, um, despite their differences. Um, this is basically showing us what are the capabilities of an over-the-counter device, kind of as we were just saying. Um, the patient can customize the devices for pitch and volume. They have some preset uh, programs for different environments. Um, but ultimately, again, the patient is involved in the fitting of the device. They are the ones who make adjustments, and often they do need to be familiar with technology um, to set up these devices, not not all, but most. Um, there are devices that have existed kind of similar to over the counter de devices that were often called personal sound amplification products um, or PSAPs for short. Um, they've never been uh, FDA approved or regulated. Um, for patients with hearing loss, they're not really intended for that, um, but they do, um, they are marketed more as devices that help to amplify sound in certain situations, such as somebody who wants to listen to birds, um, somebody who's trying to listen for soft sounds while hunting, things like that, but they really are not um, regulated by the FDA. This is another chart um, basically showing the differences between over-the-counter devices, prescription hearing aids, um, and personal sound amplification products. They're all um, electronics, but the over-the-counter devices and the prescription hearing aids are the ones that are intended for patients with hearing loss, and they are the medical devices. Um, there are also devices um, out there that are more hearables. Um, they are situation specific. Um, they're really intended for certain things such as, um, you know, headphones, Bluetooth streaming capabilities, um, TV ears, things like that. Um, but they're also not regulated by the FDA and they're not intended um, for patients with hearing loss. So when we think about over-the-counter hearing aids, there's pretty straightforward criteria for the candidacy. Individuals who are 18 years of age or older are candidates for over-the-counter hearing aids if they have self-perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. Um, so a hearing test is not required because the key there is self-perceived. So I have had patients start to ask me, you know, if they are a candidate, I'm able to answer it from the test results I have, but keep in mind, you don't need to have a hearing test. If you think your hearing loss is in the mild to moderate range and you are 18 years of age or older, you're a candidate. So it is truly up to the individual to determine if an OTC is appropriate, if it's needed, and if it works for them. So what is perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. It can present as difficulty hearing or understanding conversations, most often when there's a group setting or there's background noise, like at a restaurant or a cocktail party. It can be difficulty hearing over the telephone. It can be exhausting. So it can be people who really struggle to kind of make it through the day um, without just feeling exhausted from all the effort that goes into listening. They'll tell us that they're straining to hear people, you know, at the other end of the table or, you know, across from them at the table or next to them at a party, things like that. It can be turning up the volume of the television, um, turning up the volume of music louder than quote unquote normal or to a level where other people start to comment on it or complain about it. 
Asha put out a really nice little infographic here about the different categories of hearing loss. So when we measure hearing through a hearing test, we tell you the degree of hearing loss you have if you have hearing loss. So of course there's individuals who have normal hearing, then we have mild hearing loss, moderate hearing loss, moderately severe, severe and profound hearing loss. Again, OTC devices are for individuals with self-perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. Individuals with mild to moderate hearing loss may say that they don't have any problems hearing people in quiet situations, or they may say, I have trouble if someone's speaking at a normal volume. In noise, they may feel like they have some difficulty participating in a conversation um, rather than great difficulty. They might just say, yeah, I do have some difficulties. Just to kind of sidestep here to talk a little bit about what we do as an audiologist, audiologists are the healthcare professionals who can help to prevent, diagnose, and manage hearing imbalance disorders for people of all ages. Our scope of practice is pretty wide. In terms of what we're talking about tonight with over-the-counter hearing aids and with hearing aids in general, um, our role is comprehensive hearing evaluations and recommendations for the selection, fitting, and programming of devices. Now, again, in the OTC realm, you don't need us. <laughs> we're, we are not a part of the equation, um, but we certainly think that we have some information that could be helpful for you as you potentially go on this journey for OTCs. Typically what we do during a hearing evaluation is we find out about the integrity of the outer, middle, and inner ear. Um, we find your hearing threshold, so the softest sounds that you could hear across a range of pitches. We can identify if you have hearing loss, the type of hearing loss, and the severity of your hearing loss, and possible causes, from it, uh, possible causes for the hearing loss. We can also give you some recommendations, again, including hearing aid recommendations. What we would normally do with our patients who come in for a hearing aid evaluation in the pre-OTC world, and even now, is talk to the person about their personal communication needs and the impact of their hearing loss on their daily life. So I think all of us stress the importance of the functional impact of the hearing loss. The hearing, the degree of hearing loss is important to know, but it is by and large, not the only factor that goes into decision making and goes into our recommendations for patients. We do discuss the patient's preferences for the style of the hearing aid, the price point that they're looking at, and the different features that they're interested in. We ultimately make a recommendation. We talk about insurance benefits if they have any. Unfortunately, like Dr. Rhodes said, they're not covered by Medicare. They can be covered by Medicaid and some private insurance companies. And we will discuss the 45-day trial period and hearing aid warranties with our patients. A big component of the hearing aid evaluation is the realistic expectation uh, component of the evaluation. We know that hearing aids can improve communication, so we know that hearing aids can improve quality of life but they certainly can't restore normal hearing and they may not be enough for someone. Um, we still need to talk about using good communication strategies. We might need to talk about using an accessory or recommending oral rehabilitation to someone. So I think the counseling aspect is huge and where we add a lot of value. In the world of OTCs, again, it is self-perceived hearing loss. You do not need a hearing evaluation and you don't need a hearing aid evaluation. Um, but I think while that's really exciting, we want you all to know that with our patients here, we've brought OTCs into the conversation during our hearing aid evaluations. If we do see patients who meet the criteria and we think would be interested, we talk about it and we talk about it during those evaluations. So our role has changed slightly because we certainly aren't ignoring it. We're absolutely bringing it up to patients and mentioning it as an option. Okay, so what is our role when it comes to these over-the-counter devices? Well, while it's not needed, like Maria said, um, we can provide the diagnostic hearing testing before obtaining the devices if desired. Um, and this would be able to give you a better idea rather than just your self-perceived degree of hearing loss. It would give you an, an objective 
measure on whether or not you'd probably be a good candidate. Um, audiologists may begin to possibly sell over-the-counter devices. Um, they also might begin to provide post-fitting services such as testing the output of the devices um, in a test box or counseling patients regarding the devices um, for a fee, depending on where the devices were obtained from. Um, but there are, you know, it kind of remains to be seen how it will be a, applied in various audiology clinics. So um, this um, kind of these paragraphs here, it's looking at who can help a patient pick an over-the-counter hearing aid and why should I see an audiologist even if I choose an over-the-counter hearing aid. So while we're not needed, I think there is um, a good role for us to help patients determine you know, whether or not it is likely that they may be successful with a device like this. Um, we want to be involved. We want patients ultimately to have an improved quality of life. We want hearing devices to be accessible. Um, and you know, as an audiologist, if we are able to complete a diagnostic evaluation, we could tell you, and we do have these discussions, um, who may not be quite ready for a hearing aid um, due to their mild degree of hearing loss, um, but somebody who might want to get their feet wet with a less expensive um, over-the-counter product um, and kind of see what's involved. Um, Again, it's part of it's part of our daily discussions. So at this point, we really are embracing it and and finding a way to make it work in our clinic. Um, obviously, we do have some concerns. Uh, while we, it is not true that we're not happy about over the counter, um, although that may be a common misperception. Um, we do have concerns. So we're mostly concerned that somebody may have impacted earwax, um, they could have an ear infection, they could have, you know, a variety of medical issues going on and go to the drugstore and just obtain a over-the-counter device and stick it in their ear without really knowing what's going on. Um, it could delay kind of a medical intervention. Um, our other concerns are, you know, who are these devices going to fit and are they going to fit well? Um, as audiologists who dispense hearing aids often, um, we know that no two ear canals are the same. Um, all patients tolerate things in their ears differently. There's, you know, different curvature and, and narrowness and collapsing. And um, while many of these devices do come with a variety of ear tips, um, we, you know, we're concerned that patients are going to need a little more assistance with that. Um, also, the counseling uh, portion. We're concerned that you know these devices do come with a user manual and instructions on how to use them and how to insert them. But you know, sometimes uh, a large portion of our hearing aid dispense appointments can be just practicing the insertion and removal over and over, and tips and tricks and different mirrors get involved. And it, it's um, there's a large demographic of people that I think are going to need a little bit more support um, than just doing this independently. Um, we also provide realistic expectations. As Maria said, you know, hearing devices do not restore normal hearing. Um, they're not corrective, they're assistive. They're a tool to help you have better access to sound. Um, and you still may need to use good communication strategies depending on the environment. Um, you know, you can't um, just assume that you may not need to have somebody face you when they're speaking and have good visual cues. So we, we are concerned that those things won't always be enforced with a, um, a device that a patient can obtain independently. So may I interject for a second? Um, other concerns that we have are programming concerns. Many of these devices um, have kind of self-tuning systems. So you're able to open an app and you take kind of a hearing quiz and determine, you know, do I like sound more crisp? Do I like sound more full or rich? Um, and based on some sound samples, they can be kind of fine-tuned to each individual's um, preferences. Um, this is 
in contrast to a hearing aid, which is program based on each patient's individual um, threshold at every frequency. So it's a little less precise, um, which may be okay for the right person, but we do have some concerns about that. Um, what happens if this device isn't functioning well? What if something goes wrong? What if you know it gets clogged with wax, it stops working, it's not charging? As we know with hearing aids, they're electronics, things go wrong, and we have an influx of patients daily um, that need assistance with this. And we take care of it for them to the best of our abilities. We send it into the manufacturer. We kind of serve as the middleman for these devices. Um, and it's kind of hard to know, will it be simple for patients to reach out to these manufacturers of these devices and um, get help um, and guidance? Pricing. Um, you know, the pricing of these devices, they're not, uh, many of them or the better ones are not just a few hundred dollars. Oh yeah, sure. Joe, you want to jump in? Yeah. Do, do you mind? Just, I, I just wanted to, to make a, a comment about uh, this idea of over-the-counter hearing aids. As you were talking about that, uh, you know, and thinking about what audiologists can do and what the consumer can do. A lot of it is is knowing who you are yourself, you know, as as a person with hearing loss, because if uh, you know, right now there's so many different things that we can do. You know, we can measure our own blood level, you know, our blood sugar levels, and we can do we can monitor many things on ourselves by ourselves. We can follow the online guides, and and uh, if there's an issue, we can call customer service for the hearing aid company. You know, for the companies that make the hearing aids. And this is great for a lot of people. And, and those are really great over-the-counter uh, hearing aid candidates. If there are other people though who, who need the support and need the, the, uh, uh, um, the guidance and those people may be more uh, appropriate for the prescriptive hearing aids. It's kind of knowing what, what you like. Um, the idea that you can wear hearing aids and get them at, you know, Best Buy or, you know, maybe CVS soon, you know, I don't know, um, is really remarkable. And, uh, uh, but, you know, you have to know who you are. And, and I, uh, I'm going to go back to you, Jen. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to, to uh, yeah. make people understand that, uh, um, that, that it, it's a do-it-yourself kind of a thing. And if you're a do-it-yourself kind of a person, this is a really great opportunity. Yes, absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. Um, the pricing, something to consider again, is that these devices are not really um, just a few hundred dollars. Many of them are around a thousand dollars for a pair. Um, so, you know, hearing aids range, prescriptive hearing aids range here really anywhere from around $1,800 for a pair up to $7,000 for a pair. Um, but when you start to consider that some of our low level hearing aids um, that are prescriptive um, are around 1800 or 2000 and you're going to be spending potentially a thousand dollars potentially for um, an over the counter set um, you know you do have the support of an audiologist coming with it for not too much more money so that's also something to consider um, there's trial periods and return policy concerns. The FDA, um, you know, returns are not required by the FDA of these over-the-counter products. Um, if you look online and if you look at Best Buy, many of them do come with a um, trial period where they can be returned. Um, everything is different for different manufacturers and different sellers, um, but it's not, um, it's not mandated. So just to echo what Dr. Rose and Dr. Montano had to say, I definitely would agree that this is um, a situation where if you are the type of person who are who is 18 years of age or, or older um, with perceived mild to moderate hearing loss and you're comfortable with that self-fitting process, this is a great option for you. Um, for as while a good chunk of our patients, like Dr. Rhodes said, you know, will spend a whole appointment working on how to put it in the ear properly, um, you know, how to care for it. There are plenty of patients that 
you tell them once and they're good to go. So if you think you're the type of person who's pretty comfortable with the smartphone, pretty comfortable with technology, um, doesn't need all of that support and kind of understands that these are devices meant to help you. They're not meant to restore normal hearing or, or you know, help you hear 100% of what is said 100% of the time, then I think you're a great candidate for these. Um, and to Dr. Rhodes's last point about having a return period, which many of them seem to have, there's pretty low risk in trying these out. If it doesn't work for you, you return them within their trial period. Um, and if they work, that's fantastic. Keep in mind that an OTC might not be right for you if you're younger than 18 or you have greater than mild to moderate hearing loss. Um, we also are hesitant for individuals who have chronic ear infections or ear drainage, certainly anyone with sudden hearing loss, anyone who perceives an asymmetry or a difference between the ears, whether it's with hearing or tinnitus or, you know, ringing, buzzing, humming, those sounds in the ears. Um, people who have history of chemotherapy or radiation to the head or the neck. And for individuals who don't have a smartphone or computer, who, who don't consider themselves tech savvy, you know, kind of balk at the idea of having to set this up on their own, it may not be appropriate for them. But for those who are comfortable with that, who meet all the other criteria, this is certainly a good way to go. If you're still not really sure if you have mild to moderate hearing loss, this is just a semi-redundant checklist for you um, that in quiet environments, you feel like your hearing is pretty good to at most having difficulty hearing a normal, um, someone talking at a normal volume. And in noise, maybe not having any difficulty to saying, okay, I have some. You're not on the side of the line where you're having trouble hearing loud speech and quiet or having great difficulty in noise. If you feel like you fall into those categories or beyond, it may not be appropriate for you. You may need um, a prescription hearing aid, something that is designed for individuals with greater hearing loss. The American Academy of Audiology also gives, um, rather than like a checklist, uh, they give some questions that they would ask uh, to someone. Do you feel like you can hear easily in quiet or one-on-one -on -one situations, but experience difficulty in more challenging situations? If so, you probably meet the criteria. Um, you know, and you can read the other two, but again, basically feeling like, you know, there's some difficult listening situations that you have, as opposed to feeling like you have trouble all day, every day. Um, turning up the volume or the, of the phone or the TV helps you hear a little bit better, things like that. Then you may fall into the category of mild to moderate, in which case, again, these are appropriate for you. Again, as far as are these gonna work for me, we don't know. That is not a question we can answer, even with a hearing evaluation. We could tell you if you meet the criteria, but we don't know if they're going to work for you because that's true of any of our patients, even with prescription hearing aids. It's a matter of trying them out. It's a matter of adjusting. It's a matter of committing that time and that effort to it to see if it can work for you. And again, back to what I said earlier, I think with the return policy and the lower poise price point compared to prescription hearing aids, I think it's going to be worth a shot for a lot of patients. American Academy of Audiology, again, is saying, is an OTC right for me? They put out some FAQs for audiologists, for consumers, and you're going to see over and over in the literature that's put out there, you know, hey, check with your audiologist, check with your audiologist. It's not required, but we are here for you. We're happy to help, whether it's just answering some questions or to provide the diagnostic testing to confirm whether or not you do meet the criteria for these devices. Okay, so here we have some of the examples of devices. Um, this is just a few that uh, can be found online. There are many more, but these are some styles of devices um, and a few different companies. Sony now makes their version of an over-the-counter device. Um, and it looks very tiny and it slips into the ear similar to uh, hearing devices that we dispense here. 
Um, there's also Jabra who has their device um, or one of their devices that looks somewhat like a Bluetooth headphone. So perhaps that will help to reduce stigma um, and kind of, um, you know, lower some of the barriers to people who um, are not quite yet ready to pursue hearing aids. Um, things to consider, uh, you know, are you going to sit at a restaurant with um, these large devices in your ears that kind of look like Bluetooth headphones? Or are you going to sit in a meeting with them? Um, but regardless, still a, a good option. Um, and also the Lexi devices, which are, you know, powered by Bose. Um, there's a behind the ear portion and in the ear dome, similar to many of our hearing aids that we dispense here. Um, again, you can see the pricing. It's not, um, it's not, cheap by any means, but it is more affordable. Um, also, you just, it's important to be an educated consumer as with anything else, you wanna do your research, you wanna read the reviews, you wanna know about complaints, issues with the companies, the manufacturers, the devices. Um, we're doing the same. This is all new to many of us or, or all of us, I should say. So. We're excited for new developments. This is really kind of the first launch and I think there's a long way to go, um, but it, um, we're excited to see what comes next. Um, we're optimistic and um, you just want to do your research. Um, just also to reiterate reasons you might not want to, you know, you might want to discontinue use of uh, an over-the-counter device if you have dizziness, if you have drainage, if you have ringing in the one or both ears, if you have a sudden change in hearing loss, um, you'd want to seek medical attention. So really, what is the takeaway here? Um, the takeaway is that an over-the-counter hearing aid, it can be a great option for the right patient. If you have, like Maria said, just to hit it home, if you have the right degree of hearing loss, if you're comfortable with an independent process where you want to handle things yourself, if you're familiar with technology and not intimidated by the use of a smartphone, um, it's worth a try. Um, keep in mind, ideally, you'd want to know your degree of hearing loss just to see if you are a true candidate or a good candidate, I should say, rather than just your perception of hearing loss. Um, and it still remains to be seen how successful these devices will be um, or if they're going to reach the right patients. But again, with our assistance, I think that we can help to um, get these devices in the hands of people who would be most successful with them. But again, time will tell and we're here to help should anyone have any questions or want our advice. Um, but we're also, you know, learning a lot about this as well. So um, we're in this together. So I've been screaming, screening the questions from the audience and I thought maybe we can uh, spend a little time answering some specific questions. Um, I have one question here that says, uh, can one buy an over-the-counter hearing aid and then have an audiologist program it for you uh, if they've already done a hearing test and, a, and an exam? Will an audiologist recommend a particular brand considering your hearing situation? Maria, you want to answer that one? Sure. So unfortunately, audiologists are not able to program any of the over-the-counter devices. It is again, self-fitting, it, it'll it come through on your smartphone. We can certainly counsel you on suggestions. You know, we can talk to you about where you're experiencing difficulties and we can give you ideas of, hey, maybe I would lower the bass or the treble or try this mode or that mode. Of course, it's gonna depend on the type that you buy and exactly what capabilities that you have, but you'll certainly have the ability to adjust um, pitch to some extent and loudness. So at the very least we can give give suggestions on that, but they can't be programmed in the way a traditional hearing aid could be programmed, unfortunately. As far as recommendations, I think it's going to be a little bit specific to the audiologist. As Dr. Rhodes said, this is pretty new. And to go back to Dr. Montano's timeline in the beginning, you know, even though this has been a long time coming, they've only been out for a few weeks. So I think as we continue to do research on them, you know, we may get some more anecdotal information from patients that have tried them, you know, hopefully we'll get 
more information from, you know, fellow professionals and, you know, just word of mouth that way um, to potentially be able to recommend a couple of brands. But um, I think it, it's going to be a little bit of education on all of our parts. I think that we're very comfortable in recommending different manufacturers that we work with because we worked with them for a long time. But as far as this, ultimately, you know, any information that we have, I think will just be anecdotal since it's truly up to the purchaser, which one they want, which one they think fits their needs um, and how to adjust them. So um, another question was about cross hearing aids. Will over-the-counter hearing aids be available for people who require a cross hearing aid? Uh, Usually that is somebody with a, a asymmetric hearing loss with one hearing loss, one ear uh, performing very poorly and the other one performing better. Uh, Jen. Okay, so as of now, definitely not. Um, these devices um, are really geared for people with mild to moderate symmetrical hearing loss. Um, when you have or when you require a cross device, that means that one of the one of your ears is poor enough that it's likely more severe to profound or more severe than a mild to moderate loss. So um, as of now, to my knowledge, there are no transmitters um, or devices that transmit to the other side. Um, so no, at this point in time, I would say this is really not the the. Um, the approach for you as far as over the counter if you're requiring a cross device. Okay. Uh, Maria, uh, will you give advice on what to look for in an OTC hearing aid and on different features to consider? I would certainly feel comfortable doing that because it's, it's, a part of, I would say, our normal hearing aid evaluations currently, you know, talking about Bluetooth compatibility, um, rechargeability, things like that. So I, I would certainly um, feel comfortable saying, hey, here's things to consider. And then just like in hearing aid evaluation, it would be up to that patient to decide what's important for them. It seems like a lot of them do have rechargeable options are able to connect by Bluetooth to the smartphone as far as streaming phone calls and media. One feature that I have seen um, is not in, I don't know if it's in any, um, in one article, it certain, certainly wasn't in any of, of the handful that they um, were testing, but one feature that seems to not be out there in the over-the-counter devices is a telecoil. So for anyone who has been in a theater or even in a subway station, um, a museum, if you see that big ear with a T, it's usually a blue and white sign, um, that indicates that the space is equipped with a telecoil. You'll switch into that mode in your hearing aid, and then wherever the sound is, whether it's you know the actors on stage or the subway announcement, it will come straight to your hearing aid. So it'll eliminate the negative effect of how far you are from the source um, or potentially the negative effect of the background noise. That's a feature that's important to some of our patients, um, a decent amount of our patients. That's not in an over-the-counter um, hearing aid or, or uh, again, in the articles that I've looked at and the um, devices that I've looked at, that is a feature that is lacking. So. Most of the features that are in traditional hearing aids do seem to have carried over into over-the-counter hearing aids, and some will be more important than others to people. That seems to be one that's not in there. So, you know, certainly things that I think as an audiologist, we would be happy to discuss as far as what those features mean, what it could add to your daily life or your quality of life, and just help guide the patient to determine what what kind of matters the most to them to help them pick the right device. Uh, so this is an interesting question, Jen. Um, I have age-related mild high-frequency hearing loss from around 4,000 up, and I've been told it's not yet bad enough for a hearing aid to be useful, uh, but it's interfering with my enjoyment of music. Uh, is it possible, is there a possibility that an over-the-counter hearing aid could help? I would say absolutely. Um, I, you know, 
we see patients all the time who do have some um, hearing loss in those higher pitch sounds. Um, it's symmetrical. It looks like a traditional age-related hearing loss. Um, but just from experience, we know that they're kind of in this gray area where you're starting to notice difficulty, um, you know, you're having a difficult time in certain situations, but it's not really going to be enough to warrant hearing aids um, more often than not. Um, so what happens? We tell those people, come back in a year, we'll check it again, we'll compare it to the last test and see if anything has changed. Um, and some people are happy with that and other people are like, no, I I'm noticing difficulty and it's impacting my day-to-day -day function. Um, so I think an over-the-counter would be a perfect opportunity for somebody with that more mild degree of hearing loss to try an amplifier, see if it's helping you in certain situations. You might not want to be wearing this all the time, but there might be certain situations where you really wish you had more of those high frequency sounds. Um, so I think, again, with the low risk and potential um, returnable aspects, if you check the return policy, uh, why not, you know, this could be a gateway into hearing aids at some point in time, should the hearing worsen, you'll get an idea slightly for for what's involved um so yeah i would say you're kind of the the perfect person to to test out um an otc so um there's a, a question here from a physician who is asking are there any questionnaires or screening tools we can use to help determine if a patient has self-perceived mild to moderate hearing loss versus severe um, so what what can a physician do perhaps in their office uh, uh, to uh, screen for hearing loss, uh, Maria? Yeah, there are great resources on both the ASHA and AAA website, so the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association website and the American Academy of Audiology website that essentially is a checklist um, for patients, and you can print those out have the patients take a look at them, fill them out by all means. They looked great. They were pretty straightforward. Um, we caught some glimpses in some of the slides, but they did a really good job of, of creating those. Um, you know, you can certainly, I don't know if, if you can get in touch with, with us, I'd be happy to point you um, to the link directly, but it is easily accessible on both of those websites. Um, they've got a great toolkit for professionals and for consumers and those checklists are, are readily available and just from looking it over, I think very easy to use. So uh, someone asks uh, about the Bose model that we showed in the picture. Um, and is that the Bose model, um, have they been available for a while? And I'll answer that question because I'm familiar with when the Bose came out. The Bose actually came out last year and that model, uh, the corporation is now part of what they call Lexi hearing aids. And it is the same hearing aid that came out. They had a, um, uh, a waiver from the FDA to release their over-the-counter hearing aid before uh, the final standards were made because they felt that it was uh, within the realm of the uh, standards that were going to be uh, presented the following year. And so, yes, that is the same hearing aid that was released last October. Uh, here's another question. With a diagnosis of conductive and sensory neural hearing loss, is there an OTC aid geared for this condition? Jen? I would say no. At this point in time, you, there's no um, guidelines depending on the type of hearing loss you have, if you should pursue an OTC, you know, um, one OTC over the other. Um, but definitely, if there is a conductive hearing loss, um, you would want to have an evaluation by some sort of medical doctor. What is the cause of that? Um, could there be fluid in the ear? Could there be a hole in the eardrum? Um, could there be otosclerosis? There, there's further testing that would likely um, need to be done. So um, yeah, I would say at this point in time, I, I wouldn't recommend one versus the other, depending on you know uh, the type of hearing loss. So I understand Medicare doesn't pay for hearing aids, but does it pay for uh, audiological tests and support? Maria? 
It will cover hearing evaluations. So medical, uh, Medicare does cover hearing evaluations annually. Um, in terms of support, uh, if you ask your questions during the evaluation, by all means, <laughs> you're, you're there for the evaluation. Um, it does not cover any hearing aid services. So if you were coming for a hearing aid evaluation um, where we would generally talk about devices, uh, it would not be covered if you were coming with an you know, like say you came with an over-the-counter device and you were looking for support or things like that, it wouldn't be covered just in thinking of, you know, our office and what we do for patients when it comes to hearing aids stuff. Um, you know, but if you have your hearing tested, you meet a friendly audiologist, by all means, I would, I would ask them some questions and uh, get your money's worth out of that evaluation. <laughs> So I think we have time maybe for one more question. Now, Jen, this is for you. Uh, can you tell us uh, the different brands and models of OTC hearing aids or uh, where we can get the kind of a consumer reports test result kind of thing, something that compares the, the different models? Is that is something available on that yet? I don't know. To my knowledge, uh, no. I mean, at this point, there are many different brands, um, such as, um, like we were saying, Jabra, um, Bose, uh, Sony, um, uh, Lex, uh, Lexi, um, Lucid, I believe is another brand, um, IQ here, New here. Um, but as far as comparing, you know, specs wise, there are these articles that are coming out, but I don't know if anyone yet has really compared. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but to my knowledge, I don't know if really the specs are there yet. Um, yeah. What comparison, I should say. I believe that that will be coming. Yeah. And that yeah. I, I actually believe that Consumer Reports will uh, come up with a, a uh, an article on comparing, uh -huh. comparing the over-the-counter hearing aids because they've had regular articles on traditional hearing aids for many, many years. Uh -huh. uh, and I think that what's going to happen in the research labs is that uh, in, our, in our science programs, we're going to be testing these devices out and, and seeing the kind of outcomes we get uh, you, with uh, over-the-counter hearing aids. So I, I think it's still in the early stages. Uh, and I think that you're gonna see more and more about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, the internet, you know, that's, there's always stuff, uh, whether it's yep. good or not, but there's always stuff. Absolutely. Anyway, I, I really would like to thank you all for participating uh, in tonight's webinar. It, it, there's so much to talk about and we could probably go on for, you know, hours. Uh, and I, I can only address a handful of the questions that were, were put uh, through the chat, but um, uh, just do your homework, do your due diligence, look up the hearing aids. Uh, if you think you're a candidate, you can certainly try them. If you're looking for more support and more guidance, then uh, you know visit an audiologist, uh, have your hearing tested, have your ears examined by a medical physician, and um, I think the, you know the, the future is bright. I think that there's a lot more options available and uh, it may make the decisions a little tougher, but I think that uh, having plenty of options is a positive thing. Thank you very much for attending uh, and uh, good luck in your pursuit of over-the-counter hearing aids. <laughs>